All righty, folks. So thanks everyone for being both here in person and on Zoom. Um, and here in person, we have a we have a cake, you know, chocolate on chocolate cake for um, for Brian's. Uh, both it's both a celebration and uh, of course uh, there's some melancholy, but uh, yeah, I mean Brian has been great, right? He's had a real impact on a number of projects. Uh, that's partially why we're having this sort of global call today uh, to try to uh, spread some of the sort of development and, uh, you know, all of the progress that's been made over the last year and a half or so. Um, yeah, so huge thank you to Brian from, you know, from all the folks here as well as across, you know, A3D3, ZTF, et cetera, right? It's been a, quite the impact. And so, Thank you, Brian, for being here. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thanks for being willing to give sort of a, you know, everything you know type of talk, because yeah. I don't know, here we are. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you all for, for being here. So uh, yeah, before I go off to my industry job, I'd like to go over the, the projects that I've contributed to. And uh, really in the context of a uh, kind of demonstrational informational talk, so uh, there won't be a ton of machine learning being discussed here, except for how to run the machine learning code. So that'll be the spirit of this of this talk. And so I'll be, yeah, I'll be jumping a lot between uh, my slides here, uh, some some windows I've got open, um, but it's all I'm screen sharing the whole desktop. So uh, so that should be fine. So uh, yeah, I will get right into it here with uh, an outline of uh, of what I'll be talking about. So going to start out with uh, not so much code. I figured to start out, you know, while everyone's enjoying their cake with, uh, you know, talking about access compute allocation management um, and uh, yeah, something, yeah, something a little lighter, you know, so. <laughs> just a bit. And then, then we'll go on to the, the, the gritty details of, of the ZTF scope projects, including uh, the feature generation and inference workflows uh, that we run and the, the GCN cron job, as I call it, I'll get into that. Um, I'll also talk a bit about my experiences with uh, releasing this code on PyPI and uh, the data on Zenodo. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with a little bit about NMA, um, which uh, is another project that I've contributed to. I'll, I'll talk specifically about the uh, API service that we've developed for that. And uh, I'll finish with just a little bit of maybe more, you know, the, the scientific uh, side of things with a, maybe one slide on, a, on my thoughts on some future directions for, uh, you know, some of these uh, projects. And, uh, and yeah, so, uh, and feel free throughout this, uh, I've got volume up on Zoom and in the room, feel free to interrupt me anytime. It's that kind of talk. Um, and I'll try to, I'll try to leave some pauses as I'm going through all this stuff for, you know, uh, for some questions to be asked. So let's get into it. All right. So yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we get these compute resources from the NSF access program and we have to manage the allocation because, uh, we, you generally don't just get time on the uh, time on the resources. You have to actually make an exchange uh, of the credits they give you. Uh, so Access is an, is an NSF program to contribute, re uh, connect researchers with compute resources. Uh, we currently in the group have two main allocations that we work with. Uh, the one that is uh, has been around for longer and that more people use is the AST. 200029. And uh, so this is like a multi purpose allocation that we propose specifically talking about a bunch of different projects. Um, and, and so we have a bunch of different resources on that. The other one that we more recently got is this PHY one. And uh, that is specifically GPU resources and a lot of them uh, for scope feature generation going forward. So there's almost 100,000 GPU hours between two resources on that one. Uh, it's a bit more rigid on what can be run on that because they do expect or like the only thing we really proposed on that proposal was for scope feature generation but it's good to be aware of that one as well and like i said these are these resources are typically allocated via access credit exchanges so you get a bunch of credits and then you turn those into gpu and cpu hours and storage and things like that and so i'll flip over to the uh uh the access allocation page in a minute but uh, just to list them, the current resources that we're using are uh, SDSC Expanse, uh, Indiana Jetstream 2, and NCSA Delta is a newer one that we've got access to. And uh, there's going to be a bunch of these links throughout the slides that uh, uh, that later on you'll be able to go and click on. Uh, we uh, I've added a lot of documentation to the uh, scope recently, so 
uh, one new page here is uh, is linked here uh, for specifically managing access allocations. Uh, but I will now, this, this slide is basically a reminder to tell me to go over to the actual allocation page, but it'll also be here to, to be familiar later on. But I'm just going to go right over here. And good, it's uh, it's looking good. I'll make it a little bit bigger, perhaps. Uh, oops. Let's just drag this here, make it a little bit bigger. Okay. And uh, so when you go to the access allocations page, this is what you see. And uh, so I'm actually going to collapse the, uh, the one... Uh, with a bunch of GPU resources, because uh, again, that one is a little more specific to scope. Um, but I'm going to expand the one here that is like the more multi-purpose allocation that we have. And so you can see that uh, there's a very nice user interface here that NSF has provided that tells you how many credits you have available. We have uh, more than a million. And, uh, and then it tells you the different resources that you currently have access to. And uh, and so this is kind of the overview page. What I like even more is the credits and resources page. And so this shows you kind of this pie or, you know, this, uh, these different visualizations of, uh, of the resources you have and how much are left. So you can quickly see what's kind of running out the most and what's uh, nice and full. And uh, not only that, but you can also take a look at the, uh, the usage statistics for each of these uh, resources. So... Uh, for example, we've got uh, Expanse CPU here is one that we uh, have a lot of usage on. You actually click the little grid icon there and then see user by user uh, who has been using what. And so you can see both uh, just in the last week and month and, um, and and different time periods like that. But you can also look at the all-time uh, usage. So uh, you can scroll through here and uh, and, and get a good sense of, uh, of who's been using how many resources. And this is important because, uh, like I said, we have to exchange credits these resources so they can run out and even if you have more credits it's not going to automatically fill anything up so uh, what you have to do if uh, if you see that a resource here is starting to get a little low is that you will go and uh, actually just write in the balance box here just edit the amount and let's say we want to bring this up to ten thousand. and then once i click out of that box it'll actually highlight the uh the whole row it'll show what that'll do to the uh the bar here uh, showing your visualization of resources and then uh, all you need to do to put in the request is to add maybe one or two sentences here on the bottom um, about how this resource is going to contribute to your research. And so uh, I've told a few people this already, but I found that even though we've kind of we've technically like won the proposal already, you still have to have some kind of justification here for the exchange. So it's not enough just to say making an exchange, you know, period. Uh, you really do need to say like, something a little bit quantitative about what these resources are going to go towards. Maybe maybe something about how much you expect them to support. Like this will be a month's worth of our computations for this project. Something that, you know, just gives them some idea of um, what you're going to be using these for. So I, I have, I've never gotten one of these requests turned down, but I did get one where the, it was graded as poor mm -hmm. and uh, they were not happy. They said, We'll give you this one, but the next one you do better have more details because we're not happy about this. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's something to keep in mind. Yes. Uh, what do we use the GPU allocation for? What do we use the expanse GPU on this allocation for? So this was scope feature generation until recently, and now that's that's being offloaded up to this one. It still is uh, being used for the kind of uh, smaller scale scope GPU things you run. So specifically, this GCN cron job that I'll get into later. Uh, that's still connected to this resource here because it uses a lot less GPU time. So um, I think that's the main thing. I think there may be a few other people um, using this as well, possibly for, for NMA related things. So uh, yeah. That's great now. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's what we're using the uh, the GPU allocation here for. And uh, let's see. So I'm just, uh, I think, yeah. So then there's a few other things you can do here. I'll, I'll go through it kind of quickly. Uh, you can go to users and roles here and uh, add another user. So oftentimes when we get a new member of the group, they'll they'll want to get access to these resources and they have to first make a uh, an account on access and then give you their username. And then you can type it in and it'll be added here. You can check boxes on uh, who has access to what resource and, uh, and then you're all set. And uh, you can also adjust like roles. So we have several uh, incoming allocation managers who will be able to do what I'm doing here. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's all, it's all very, uh, it's a good interface. So, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've had no real trouble using it aside from the, uh, the, the picky, uh, grading on my requests, but, uh, that's okay. 
So I think that was all I wanted to mention here, unless there are any other questions. What's the Jetstream 2 for? Jetstream 2 is for... Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Weissman's mostly, because that, that's... Jetstream 2 is if there are things where you benefit from a lot of CPUs in one big place, and so the yeah, active observing scenarios is helpful. All right, are there any questions uh, in the room or on Zoom about the uh, allocation management? So, so that's, yeah. this is just for uh, like trading time between the different resources on these on these different <laughs> systems. That's right, yeah. It's just for making sure that we all have the, the resources that we need, because uh, it, yeah, it's except for the very specific kind of proposal we put in for the scope GPU hours, they generally give you credits and not resources. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good question. It, it depends on your previous requests because you might, you know, you might have only put in a little bit. But I found that um, roughly uh, every few weeks to a month cadence, I feel like I have to update something. The last time I requested resources recently for like, I, I specifically said, this will be a month's more resources. They said, you know, you can request resources for more than a month if you want. So I'm getting, you know, I'm getting mixed signals here. I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry. Oh, yes. That's an important thing to highlight that you can, um, you can decrease these numbers too. You know, if I want to go down to 1000 here. Um, I can increase my credit balance. So uh, yeah, these are not permanent exchanges. Does but... that require submission for requests? Uh, I think it. I think it does. Um, yeah, I think you still have to submit for approval and give a little uh, a summary here. So um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, these are all all very good questions. Uh, I'll just make sure on Zoom that I don't see any hands raised. Uh, but you can also feel free just to unmute and interrupt me. So so. Right now, like just to use myself as an example, I'm running scope feature generation. That's on the Delta CPUs right now, or I, or is it on Expanse? Yeah. So right now you're running on Expanse, okay. uh, but you're using this other allocation here that does not have any credits associated with it. Gotcha. So this yeah, it's, this is like the the maximum kind of proposal you can put in. It's called Maximize Access. I do have a slide about proposals coming up um, that I'll briefly go through, but- and that's in the, the, the like UMN 131? Uh, or the that? one, yeah, the one you're using is 141. Oh. That's the new one, the okay. one, yeah. So what we're, what we're talking about here is uh, this is resource dependent, but every project that gets resources added will get some kind of a project name or, or identifier. So on Expanse, that's like the storage, like the project storage associated with this grant here is UMN131. And up here, it's UMN141. Don't ask me how they get those, but you kind of, I think you type in like accounts on on these cluster resources and they'll like show what accounts you have access to. I guess you, when you just submit jobs, you just, it's just the organization or fuzzy user. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, yeah, I think it's dash capital A is the, yeah, the account or you could do, yeah, and that's the one that you put in. But I found on Delta, it's different. It's like four letters instead of, you know, letters and numbers and it kind of just, yeah, no, no rhyme or reason to what they are. But so it's different in every resource, but you kind of, yeah, kind of have to find that and, um, and use it. Uh, so, but yeah, so Daniel's been using uh, Expanse so far, but yeah, we also have a bunch of these GPU hours on Delta. So we'll be uh, diving into those as well. Are they different GPUs on Delta versus Expanse? Uh, they are. Uh, I think it's uh, NVIDIA A100s on Delta and V100s on Expanse. So in theory, Delta should be faster, which maybe is why they allocated fewer GPU hours on that one, because they're faster. I'll say I, I did try installing Scope and running feature generation on Delta, and it ran, but it seemed to run slower. So... Can't figure that one out. It was about two times slower. Uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm sure there's a way to um, get that running the way it should. And I, I, hopefully there, there's a file that I'll that I've put on the repository or a directory that is specifically for Delta with some of the customizations there. That um, wish I could say it was all running perfectly, but yeah, it, it is running.
other questions on allocations. I'll just bring up the slide again here too. Uh, all right. Then let's go on to just a, a brief discussion of proposals. So I did write a few proposals for uh, access. Um, and so got a bit of insight to share there. There are different kinds of requests you can make. Uh, the, the simplest ones are extensions and supplements. Um, so these are for existing proposals. And if you, if you either need more time or more credits or resources, then you can put in one of these and it's, you don't need to do everything that you would do for a full proposal. So, uh, for an extension, it's actually just a few sentences. I think on the, uh, uh, let's see on the, it might not be an option here since we just extended this one, but like here, there's a button to request more credits. That's like a supplement, uh, an extension, um, yeah, it's, I think there's another button around here that like, as you're, as the time gets closer to running out, you know, that like this one goes until September of this year, then it's pretty straightforward just to, to say that you're continuing your work, you made this kind of progress, and then they won't cut you off uh, cold there. So, um, so those are useful uh, requests to know about. Uh, but then when you, if you want to write a new proposal, then there are actually four different levels of proposal that you can write, and they all have different descriptive names um, based on how many resources you want. And so the one that I wrote most recently was called Maximize Access. Um, and so this was the most involved one because it, it doesn't it doesn't award credits. You actually just do ask for specific resources um, and a certain amount of them. Uh, and so this was a 10 to 15 page main document that talks about the scientific merits of the work that's being done. Um, it, it talks about the, the work you've already done on cluster resources to benchmark it um, in some detail and has some descriptive tables. Uh, but then there's also these separate documents that are required that are each about three pages. Um, so it wants a progress report that, you know, shows that you've used some lower level of resource uh, allocation to make some progress because they, they probably won't give you this off the bat. Uh, but then there's also like a, a separate three page code performance document that they want that they really want. They like the, the specific details here. So like we ran this much uh, of our process on this resource and it took, you know, this amount of time per, per light curve or something like that. And so uh, they, they very much like the, uh, specifics here. So uh, going forward, if you need to propose for more uh, more resources through access, I think they're they're very reasonable, um, but they do, you know, just do keep in mind, they really like the uh, the specific quantifications here. So make sure we include our code, effectively benchmarking in most of our code. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah, as you're writing code now and in the future, things that, that benchmark um, your runtimes and, and resource demands are very useful because so I, I did have to go back and look at like a bunch of my slurm emails to see you know uh how long everything ran and luckily it was uh they were all there so uh yeah and then it's like write a script to go go through all of them but uh, it worked out but uh yeah that's definitely a good thing to take out of this uh of this slide even even right now as you're developing code i will say guys we as Caltech will continue, this is where the LIGO folks in the crowd, Caltech will continue to try to cut us off here. And so, because the, as time goes on, those resources are meant more and more simply for online, really need to be there in the moment type data. And that's, they're, you know, they're not gonna continue to enable us necessarily super long-term um, for doing all of our offline stuff there too. And so, you know, NSF is encouraging us to do stuff like this and the open science grid and all this other kind of stuff. So this is this is stuff our group is gonna have to, no matter what, get good at here in the next you know, few years. All right, are there other questions on any of this NSF access related stuff? How many, how much long, how much can you extend slash supplement a given proposal? I don't think there are hard limits that I know of. Um, there are limits for any given request, but um, I think as long as you keep showing you're making progress, then there's no rule saying you can't extend more than once or, you know, you extend a year, then you reach that end, you know, you extend it another year. I I think that's all feasible as far as I'm aware. And uh, as long as you have a good progress report. Even the uh, maximize uh, proposal, like when I talk to people there about, um, you know, what if I, what if we fall a little short, you know, on the maximize GPU hours? Uh, they'll take supplement credit or resource requests for that too. So yeah, they're definitely flexible as long as you're uh, making progress with, they, with what they've given you. So yeah.
Okay, so that's that's the light stuff. Uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's let's get into the ZTF scope. Uh, it's been a great project. It's uh, yeah, been a lot of fun to work on and uh, and presented some interesting challenges that we've been able to uh, to overcome to get to the point where we are now. So just as a reminder, this is a uh, machine learning classification project uh, to classify variable uh, objects in the ZTF, the Swiggy Transient Facility. And uh, and so there is uh, a paper that I led on this that is now in press. I sent the uh, proof corrections back today. And uh, so that covered 77 ZTF primary fields, uh, classified a little over 200 million light curves to this point. Uh, and, but there's still about 560 or so primary fields to go. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're more than 10% of the way there, but there's, uh, there's, there's work to be done. So, uh, yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's like 3 billion in each, in each band, I think. Yeah. Something like that. And not all of them will meet the criteria for, you know, classification, but it's, yeah, it's, uh, of order 10 to the nine. And, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, just a few more helpful links here. Uh, definitely check them all out to so the, the GitHub repo, the the documentation, and then within the docs, a uh, a pretty extensive script guide that I wrote recently. That uh, it's it's kind of dense, but it will I think I, I think it hopefully communicates a lot of the uh, the details. Um, and you can always go to like a section there if you're only interested in feature generation or inference. Then uh, you should be able to you know find a section devoted to that specifically. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the main goal with scope here will be to be uh, continue the feature generation and inference process so that we can get these primary fields all classified. And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. So we've been using our HPC resources for this, uh, specifically the uh, GPU accelerated period finding is the kind of the core of that uh, process and the reason we need all these resources. And so, uh, yeah, here's where we get a little bit more uh, uh, in depth on, on some of this. So uh, first, uh, so basically with any new HPC resource uh, and scope, you're going to want to install the code. And so you want to create a, a virtual or Conda environment uh, that if it's easiest if you call it scope dash and you don't have to, but uh, that's how some of the code, um, uh, that's what some of the code will look for automatically. Um, and Python 3.11 is what we're uh, currently testing and, and, and uh, preferring to run scope on. Uh, then now the scope ML is a PyPI package. You can pip install scope ML. So that simplifies the process. Uh, if you're developing scope, then I'd suggest installing from the source locally, but uh, on a cluster, it's fine to pip install it. And then uh, then you run this command that uh, the script that'll be uh, installed called scope dash initialize, and that'll create the directory structures and config files that you need to uh, uh, to customize scope and to, to get it to run. Uh, then uh, this is an important step if you're running GPU period finding is to install the period find package from the source uh, while you're on one of the GPU resources that you're uh, using. So you'll basically want to fire up a GPU instance, say, in, in Expanse or elsewhere, and then uh, follow this link to the uh, period find code. And uh, there's just a few lines to run to uh, you clone it and then install it from the source. But it is an important step and uh, if you're, if you're going to be uh, running the period finding. Then you customize your config.yaml file, which will have been generated by the scope initialize uh, script. And um, and then uh, you'll uh, to start the feature generation, you'll want to run what I call a slurm submission script. So I'll get into this structure here on the next slide, but we have kind of two scripts generally uh, to run these jobs on a cluster. And uh, uh, yeah, Daniel. Um, with it, you also need to customize the, the submission script because I believe the default right now is my email. Yes. So I don't want all of your slurm emails. <laughs> Yes, Daniel. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, you're, Daniel is currently the the user on these example scripts because I'll, I'll get to it. But there's yeah, there's a whole new directory on the scope repository called HPC files that kind of has example both directories and scripts within them, so that you, you don't have to start from scratch here. But yeah, Daniel's the uh, the the user on those right now. Does scope initialize get the HPC directory structure, or do you have to directly clone that? So yeah, you have to directly clone that right now. Okay. Uh, it's just yeah, it's it's new enough, and there's enough files that it seemed like maybe a little too much to include with the the, the PyPI package. Maybe you know it's all pretty lightweight, so it could be added, um, but it could always be copied over. You know, after cloning. That's so how it's intended for running like exclusively on clusters, or is it possible to like debug things locally? Oh uh, yes, you can debug things locally. It's uh, it's it was I guess the main intent was to make it you know easier to install. Um, on clusters, but it, there's definitely nothing 
specific, you know, about a cluster, except that uh, the period find installation is not going to work if you don't have a CUDA GPU. Um, so, <laughs> but the rest of the code should work. So if you're if you're not generating features locally, then uh, yeah, this all still can uh, uh, be installed and tested locally. And uh, so yeah, just keep uh, keep in mind, like I mentioned, that. Uh, I'm already seeing a lot of differences between uh, Expanse and Delta. So every HPC is going to have some specific details that will require a bit of trial and error as you're getting this installed. What module do you do to get CUDA loaded in and all the all the files there that you need? And um, so and when you're seeing very obscure errors, then maybe it's just a module that you need to load in or something. So, uh, yeah. All right. So this gets into... I mentioned this uh, HPC files uh, directory on scope that has all these different uh, useful files and scripts and directory structures. This is the typical structure that you'll see for any kind of scope feature generation um, process. Uh, and I'll, I'll I'll go to the bottom here first that note that even though I'm referring you to this like you know collection of directories and scripts, you can generate just about all of them with code and scope. I think it just is a lot easier and maybe a little, uh, it, it's it's easier to keep everything consistent from one user to the next by having the example scripts with all those all the arguments set to what they have been uh, so far, and uh, but you can you can definitely generate uh, these directories and the sort of scripts with code in scope. Uh, but basically, what will happen when you if you ran one of those scripts or if you go onto this uh, HPC files directory is that uh, you'll see something like generated features with some name after it. So I very uncreatively when I was kind of revamping the feature generation process with scope called this called the one that I work with generated features new uh not exactly semantically versioned but uh you know it uh it's this is the one that is, I've been using for uh scope like the field by field scope feature generation and so what you'll see within that are these two directories here and uh the, I'll, I'll start with the uh the logs directory uh so this is just uh basically empty to start out but it's uh, meant to hold all of the uh, the Slurm logs that you get from uh, from running jobs, um, so that's where all those will appear. And then there's the Slurm directory. So this is created when you run, for example, generate features Slurm, and that's going to create, like I said, two different Slurm scripts that are the core of running these jobs. Uh, so the first one here um, is uh, down at the uh, the bottom right is just called Slurm.sub, and this is the job that you would use if you were just submitting one round of feature generation. Um, and accept that instead of uh, instead of specifying a specific ZTF field here, it has wildcards that allow it to you, you can uh, in your uh, when you queue up the job with say the S batch command, uh, you will you can provide the um, a specific number that's associated with the field CCD and quadrant, and then um, you can it'll run that specific combination, and then you can you can imagine you could do this you know if you're doing this manually, you just pro provide a different a uh, different number for each call to this uh, uh, slurm.sub script and, and manually generate all the uh, features for all the 64 quadrants of a given field. Uh, but that could be uh, kind of tedious. So that's where this uh, slurm submission script uh, comes in up here. And so basically the script that you actually run when you want to run feature generation on a large scale for a bunch of, uh, uh, for one or more fields is uh, slurm submission.sub. And so this one will... Uh, It'll basically submit a uh, a Python script that I've written in Scope to take a look at which um, fields have been requested to run, whether there's any quadrants that have already been finished and saved locally or otherwise listed in the config file to exclude, maybe because they're finished, and uh, and then it will queue up all the jobs that are still uh, remaining to be run by repeatedly uh, making s batch uh, calls with uh, slurm.sub as the file that is referencing. Yes, it doesn't use like job arrays. Uh, no, it, it it doesn't. Yeah, it's uh, it's the exact same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah, definitely not necessarily the uh the most streamlined process here, but it does uh, it does do things pretty automatically for the fields that you specified, and it won't duplicate effort uh, as long as either the files exist already or you've uh, specified in the config that you don't want to do that field, and. Uh, so yeah, this will actually be some Python code that's uh, uh, that's that's running this, and then in that Python code, we'll be doing you know sbatch slurm sub with the uh, the wildcards it's giving. Yeah. So um, yeah, that is the general structure of um, 
of the, the Slurm code, uh, the Slurm scripts that we have for uh, for this process. I also have this uh, FG sources uh, directory down here that it's it's got a dashed line here because this is not used for field by field feature generation, but this or or some other directory with, uh, it, could, it doesn't have to be this name, but this is the default. Uh, this is where you would put uh, lists of individual ZTF light curves if you wanted to run this not on field by field, but say you just had you know a bunch of targets with RAs and decks that you wanted to run this on, then uh, you'd have to first format that list in a way that is uh, readable by scope. And then you'd put those file, that file or those files, plural, in this directory here. And, uh, and then uh, somewhere in these Slurm scripts, then you'd, there'd be some modifications to refer to uh, the files that are within this directory here. So um, that's why I've got it here is kind of with the dashed uh, connection here. And um, so I'll get into that a little bit more in upcoming slides, but I'll, I'll pause for questions. Yeah. So this is for single field? Uh, it it could be a single field, but you can also specify more than one config, more than one field in the config file at once, and it'll uh, run all of them. Very good question. One that I've considered. Uh, yeah. Is there also something to like handle? account for like job limits in clusters? Uh, yes. So there's a max instances argument because yeah, you, on expanse, you can only open up 24, I think. Oh, well, it depends on for GPU. I think it's like, yeah, yeah. I think it's like 4096 for CPU, but for GPU, which, you know, these jobs are queuing, it's like 24 at once. And so I usually set it at 20 just so that, you know, we're not, not filling up the entire, I think that, I don't know if that's per user or per like all of us. So, you know, I don't want to be taking up. Okay. It might be per user. Right? Yeah. You think you would be allowed to queue up more than 25 and then just only have 20, 24 running. But yeah, I know. Yeah. So I think, yeah, the main practical reason why we don't just put in all the fields and just run, run, run is uh, then there really won't be intermediate results for a specific full field. And and so, you know, it'd be nice. It's nice to, you know, to say this field is done, you know, and then put it on Zenodo and, you know, and I don't know, I guess it just feels more like a, a sense of progress, you know, and uh, then, you know. yeah, yeah. So the 48 hour limit on like job lifetimes as well. Right. Yeah. That's right. They the will. Submission script would. You could have the submission script resubmit itself. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I've done awful things with Slurm systems. <laughs> so for FG sources, um, so you're saying this is this is by RA and DEC, and can you specify a radius then? Because you're just looking mm -hmm. for okay. It doesn't. This this one doesn't know anything about like CTF object ID, or does it? Uh, yeah, so actually that is one of the columns that'll be in the wow. files that are in there. So there's actually like a data wrangling step that I've got a Jupyter Notebook kind of describing that you could really just give me a list of RAs and decks and nothing else. And you could then, but then I'd basically run some kind of cone search query. And and then, the, yeah, the, you, you start out by providing the, um, the ZTF IDs here rather than the coordinates. Okay. Mostly because I think the Kowalski query actually runs a lot faster um, on the IDs. And so because this, like all those, that will be GPU time that's being charged, you know, it's, I feel it's better to just locally run the, the cone search and then, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So I saw Zach's online, but Zach usually provides RA and DEC or he provides IDs or how does, how does this other group work? Uh, yeah, I guess RA's DECs and Gaia IDs as well as some other information and uh, the Gaia IDs can be passed along it's like the identifier for that specific object but really all i need is the uh the coordinates to uh to make it work this is more of i guess a general expanse question but do, do um do the gpu resources have the same thing about memory usage uh let's see you mean like like maximum memory yeah, like yes you have two gigab gigabytes per core in the cpu plus pair of resources yes so a a gpu service unit is one gpu uh with up they say less than 10 cores so i don't know if that means or like like cpu uh, well i think they mean uh associated cpu okay. cores so i usually do nine because i don't know if less than less than is less than or equal to or not so <laughs> let's play it safe um less than 92 gigs of memory so i do 91 usually we're getting ripped off on the cpu so yeah <laughs> i i know um and one hour of runtime so that's like one gpu unit um, and they will double it if, say, you do 180 
uh, four, you know, gigs instead of 92. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah, they will, uh, they'll scale it up by the factor by which you exceed the one service unit for any of them. So if you double the cores or you double the memory, um, whatever it is, you'll be charged for like the, whatever's the highest above the highest fraction above the one service unit. Um, so there's always a fear to that ratio. You need more cores. You may as well just add more. Right. Yes, that's right. And, uh, Unless there's some other reason why you don't, you know, we might want to have more cores, like too many queries to Kowalski simultaneously, then, you know, that's actually something that's, uh, I think I have in a, the pitfalls here coming up. I've got a slide on like troubleshooting and issues. So, I mean, it, no. if you hit it hard enough, then yeah, it will, uh, yeah, it'll just kind of yeah, fail some queries. We talk about that with BCN all the time. It's pretty robust, but yeah, at some point. Um, yeah. So, um, yes. So yes, I think I, I think I answered your question. Yes. That. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, and I, yeah, some of this is, uh, a little bit mentioned more on, on some of the upcoming slides. So maybe I'll, uh, no, it's all right. It's, it's good to, this is the kind of discussion I want to have. So this is very good. So I think I probably, there's a lot of text on some of these slides. Sorry about that. Um, maybe, maybe it's good, uh, at least as a reference, uh, going forward, but, uh, um, I think we've, we've talked about some of this, just, you know, check out, in this, again, this HPC files directory on GitHub, check out the generated features new folder for field by field feature generation. Uh, this requires a file called slurm.dat, which is generated with this script, uh, check quads for sources in scope. So I think I'll hop over to the GitHub real quick. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Let me uh, go here and let's drag this there maybe and go to uh, GitHub and specifically the um, HPC files. And so, yeah, there's this uh, within generated features new in Slurm. There's these different slurm.dat files. These two, the dr20 and just the slurm.dat are identical because um, this is like the name that the code is looking for. Um, and basically what this is doing after you run that code, it finds whether there are any light curves in every quadrant uh, that, uh, that it can possibly check. And if so, then it'll assign it like an integer number that uh, is like that job number. So, um, and that integer is what then gets passed in as a wildcard to the uh, scope feature generation script to run that combination of field CCD and quadrant. So um, just another file that I thought uh, was worth making you aware of. We do have this, you know, this is all done for like the DR20, the current uh, catalog on, uh, on Kowalski and uh and of course, then, you know, even though we're using DR20, we're cutting off the light curves at uh, the DR16 endpoint to make it consistent with the uh, the training data that we have. So just thought I'd mention that too. And so there are a few spots in the config file that are really important for feature generation with the fields. So the first is uh, uh, basically within the feature generation and then within that fields to run. Uh, that's a list that then should be populated with the uh, all the integer field numbers that you want to run next. You can also then scroll to the very bottom of the config file and use the new fields to exclude uh, entry to basically, uh, the intention here, it says, it says fields to exclude. It's basically fields that should be considered done already uh, should be listed here. And then the code will know what to do with that. It'll be impossible then for you to re you know, queue again a, a field that's already been done, even if you don't have the files locally uh, in your on your HPC account. And uh, uh, yeah, so then when you've got this all configured, then you run basically just one S batch where you, from the main scope directory that you're in, go to generated features new and then slurm and then slurm submission.sub. And uh, the the catch here is that um, if you if you do this as the scripts are written now, you have to make sure you're in the directory where you have your the config file that you want to use because it'll basically check the current working directory for config.yaml. And um, if it's not there, then it's going to, give you an error. Um, you can also alternatively uh, set the config path uh, argument to uh, in in basically the uh, in the call to the job submission code that's within the Slurm script. Uh, you can set that path to anything you want, but it's probably easiest just to be running um, from the main scope directory where the config file lives and be modifying that one. But either way, it's, uh, this is supported. So is there a is there like a master list 
checked in for kind of this, these fields are done by you. Okay. Yeah, that's another file that's on, uh, yeah, the, uh, it's on Zenodo. The fields.json has all the fields that are already done. All right. Yeah, that's probably the point of reference. Otherwise, it is also in, there's an example config file here without tokens called hpcconfig.yaml. Um, and if you scroll to the very bottom of that, now this, of course, is only as up to date as the GitHub, you know, uh, is. But this is the uh, the master list here then of uh, fields to exclude, with everything here being done and now uh, uploaded on Zenodo. So there's another spot for it. Yeah. Um, not on GitHub. I would say that in the future, the best place to look for that is on Zenodo. There's a fields.json which has a list of all of the fields that have been uh, that have been that are done basically. Is there something that will like let uh, like like submit finished job fields do this, or do you have to let say that again? Is, is there something that will like when someone runs a field? Will, is there something in scope that will like push that finished field? Nope. There? No, there isn't. Not yet, anyway. But if you did, uh, in the human yeah, yeah, the, that's what I'm saying. The human sphere puts it on the data. So we're gonna have to think about if indeed multiple people are. You know, let's imagine someone's in charge of your metamatic stance, and someone else is running on Delta, and so on. We'll have to navigate this a bit here just to try to figure out how we're keeping track of fields and their orders and stuff. You probably definitely authorize users to like handle that. Well, it's more of these. Yeah, we'll just partition the ones that are run. Yeah, so these fields, it started out as a 20 field sample that was kind of, that was completed before I got here. And then first it was rerun the 20. And then it was uh, run another 20 that are like right next to the original um, 20. And then we also went uh, directly above and below in uh, declination. So yeah. Uh, and then throw in some custom or like some other kind of more random ones that were either the ultrasat fields or the uh, the ZTF experiment kind of region that it was looking at. So where there was some interesting overlap um, with with stuff that was going on. So yeah, that was kind of the the motivation for picking these. The answer is it's chaotic. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhat chaotic. Yeah. 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 My, my plan going forward for uploading things to Zenodo is right now all the all of the predictions are in this one gigantic 13 gigabyte zip file, which is really not the best format. So my idea is to like partition the remaining fields into batches of like 10 to 25. I haven't decided on what number. And then these could sort of be handed off like, okay, you run these 25, get all the predictions, zip them up and uh, and have sort of individual bundles together and then uh, modify the fields.json that's here to basically be like, you know, file one is these fields, file two is these fields. So that's sort of my vision for how to streamline this. So you don't have to download all of the fields for no reason. We could group them like, you know, this region of the sky is all in one together so yeah we'll just partition what's remaining and then if anyone else is running it they get you know that's theirs only they only run those ones so we won't SPSS doesn't buy ra right they have these ra slices ra stripes so we should think about how to bundle these together in a way that the community will understand and be happy with because number ids is at least kind of weird right we should think about. Yeah, and this file is definitely going to grow. I mean, already when you decompress this, I think it's approaching 100 gigabytes. So yeah, it'll be good. So, yeah. You're not starting to get them hard drives. <laughs> and th there's also not uh, a great way to, like you have to download it locally and then over the internet, like via browser, upload it into Nodo. You can't do it like directly, which is, which is a little. Was this why you were asking about the CSE, CSE storage limit earlier? No, that's a separate. Okay. Okay. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you figure that out? Yes. How much is it? Um, 
So your like home is five gigabytes, but you have like an extra partition that is twice that, which you can upgrade. But I only needed like just barely over five gigs. Expansive like a hundred in your home, and then a terabyte in scratch. Or I air. I think that's actually a good point. I wanted to raise about expanse. I've never encountered any actual accounting for the storage on expanse. Like I've never worried about it. I've never had to top off the allocation or, you know, like the credit exchange. I just did a terabyte for each resource, just kind of left it. And I don't know, maybe that's just, I don't know, maybe if you really stacked it up, it starts to complain, but I don't think it oh, Okay. Yeah. Same as I, if it runs over cables, you won't be able to run jobs anymore. Yeah. Okay. 101 gigabytes for the uncompressed Zenodo file nice. for reference. <laughs> maybe someday we'll see how, how much it's going to handle. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe one day we'll just bump into their uh, their limit, which they don't really inform us of. But <laughs> Project Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other questions, uh, comments, either in the room on Zoom. Is the, the fields.json is the that has the master list of everything that's in that 77 field zip. Yeah, it's basically this list here. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's continue. So that was field by field feature generation. And uh there's also, like I mentioned, like curve by like curve feature generation. So this is a very analogous slide to the previous one. Just check out this generated features under MS uh, folder on uh, on the GitHub for example, uh, scripts and directories here. The main differences uh, from the field by field um, feature generation is that here you need to provide individual ZTF light curve IDs to the code. And uh, specifically the format, uh, the files here have to include a column called ZTF underscore ID, all lowercase. Uh, they have to include this coordinates column that even though we're, even though it really just needs the IDs, we we still provided this coordinates column for so the, the features are uh, formatted well later on. This can be this is like straight from the Kowalski query. You'd love the cone search, so it shouldn't be something you really have to manually format. You can also optionally give it what I what the code calls a Fritz name. Uh, you can see this this came originally from when all the sources were were, were definitely on Fritz, so. It might not be the best name for it, but basically this can be any identifier that you want that's uh, unique, um, or you can you can just assign it a coordinate-based uh, ID or anything like that. Uh, to do this formatting, you're not uh, you're not on your own. You can check out the uh, the under main sequence data wrangling notebook uh, it, again in HPC files to uh, see an example here. And so um, yeah, like I said, basically it's just reading in whatever file you're given. Um, doing a cone search with a specific uh, radius uh, for ZTF light curves around each each object, and then um, dropping any any duplicates from that list and then formatting it in this uh, ZTF ID coordinates and, and potentially for its name columns and saving it either as one file or if there's too many light curves, um, I'd suggest saving it as a batch uh, of files. And I'll get into that actually in an upcoming slide about the numbers there. But basically at some point, the, uh, the 48 hour GPU job time limit on Expanse at least uh, makes it so that you'll just run out of time before you finish running it. If say you have a million light curves to work on, so um, that's. But I'll get into that a bit more. And uh, there's only one Slurm script in this case. There's no job submission script. Uh, instead, you just submit one Slurm job per list of light curves you want to run. So again, that could just be one job overall, or it could be a bunch of them if you're batching up the the uh, the source the light curve uh, ID lists. And so it would look something like this. We've got this dr20 slurm.sub, which is very similar to the slurm.sub of the feature generation, uh, field by field feature generation. But uh, you do this export uh, argument, and you basically, at least in, in the example we have here, it's uh, a variable called idx, the index um, that is basically a, a part of the file name that's just incrementing from zero to, in this case, like 14. Um, and so you just, uh, you know, that was not enough for me to automate that process. So I just manually, you know, uh, did each uh, uh, ran each job here, um, exporting a different wildcard value for the uh, in, in that appears in the file name. So uh, those are the main differences from the uh, the other form of feature generation with the the ZCF fields. Um, you mean like like curve by like curve? Yeah. So 
uh, we might want like across a bunch of different fields, just a few, you know, um, a few sources that we're interested in. So um, basically since, you know, since the, uh, since the field by field feature generation takes, um, you know, it's going to take a, a pretty long time to get all the primary fields done. That's one reason. Really the main reason is that we might not, we might want to do something different than the default scope um, period finding is kind of the, the usual way here. So um, what I was working on most recently with Zach and others is a uh, five minute uh, minimum period instead of 30, which we usually do for scope. So again, there it's more, more resource demanding. You don't want to, you know, run all the fields through that. So um, yeah, that's another reason. Is the default for this one still set at five minutes as the minimum period? Yes, in this example, Slurm script, the uh, minimum period is set at five minutes. Yep, as is the minimum cadence. Because uh, remember, in scope, we um, if we have very uh, a very high sampling rate, then we will only keep the first of those points up until a certain time window. After that point, by default, that's thirty minutes in scope. For this um, like curve by like curve example script, it's down to five minute minimum cadence. Yes. How much more than that makes the five minute minimum cadence than the thirty? It's it's basically linearly scaling. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions here? All right, then we can continue. So this is the uh, yeah the kind of the pitfalls and issues slide that I've run into during all these different kinds of feature generation. So uh, first is the need to ensure that all quadrants of the fields you're running actually finish successfully, um, because they're you know you, you're running sixty four of these usually per field. Maybe one of them either Expanse had a hiccup or Kowalski had a hiccup or something happened where that parquet file at the end that you're looking for just did not get generated, but. Um, as as good as the uh, I'd say the the submission scripts are at you know queuing stuff without repeating, they're not as good at identifying a failed job and then rerunning it. So basically, how I've been approaching it here is I've just been running a couple fields at a time, um, and then when when everything stops running, I'll just run the Slurm submission script again with the same fields, but I'll make sure that this reset running flag is given, and basically there that's gonna um, it's going to tell the code that, okay, all the jobs stopped running, so don't treat anything as running right now. Um, it'll it'll wipe out these empty files that we create that basically have a dot running extension that uh, it's kind of a rudimentary way to keep track of which quadrants have been queued. And then it'll just see if, any, if there are any parquet files missing from that field and queue them up. So that's, it's not the most real-time efficient, but it will... Um, it will help to make sure that you're getting all the quadrants that you expect. Um, there may be some better way to do this more automatically, but that's kind of how it's uh, how I've been doing it so far. A quick way that I've been able to track a field's finish. So um, in the generate features new, there'll be a directory for each field. And um, when it executes successfully, there should be 128 files in there. So if you do... Um, I guess I'm not going to do, but if, if you do ls dash one, like line wc dash l, it'll spit out the number of files for you. So if all those are 128, everything is there. So there's yeah. 64 parquet files. The, there's these dot running files, which are yeah. sort of just empty files that, um, so it can check to see if the file is being processed currently. So it doesn't spool up jobs for things that are already going. Does yeah. it not kill the like or delete the dot running files it, at the conclusion of the script? Yeah, it, it could do that, but the script might end before everything finishes running. Yeah. So Is that's there a better way to like detect that it's finished running. Like, yeah. Pull up, like, like is there some line in the part you have a parquet file? Doesn't it just save all at the end? So if there's no parquet, it's not Done, right? right. Yeah, it'll only it only save the results if it's completed the process. So yeah. yeah. So if there's no parquet, it's it's yeah, or it's not done. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much, Lynn. So uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think yeah the the challenge is that yeah the the submission script could uh, submission script could end before all the jobs stop running. Maybe. Um, 
And, and it's, it's one thing, the script can tell how many jobs are running when it started. So like that, it, it won't bump up, bump up against that max uh, instances. You know, even if you've already got 10 instances, instances running from a previous submission, it, it, it'll know that, but it won't know which field CCD and Quadrant are still running. There, there might be a way with like the job name, for example, to keep track of that. Right now, they all have the same job name. That might be a good way to, uh, you know. Start the job. Yeah. Yeah, you could kind of, yeah, you could match. You can match. Like, like a shell command that prints out the queue and then you strip out the job IDs. Yeah. I think the most really useful really way would be yeah, really. just do uh, field CCD quadrant in the job name in that general thing. So you know which, you know, so you can check your emails and see which jobs were submitted and which ones were finished and stuff. That seems probably like this. Yeah, you can use just you can set job name to the wildcard since you're running it through Python. That's that's what I do for all of my scripts with like NMI. Yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty promising. I think, uh, yeah. You could you could look into that and see if you can implement that. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be too hard. Yeah, that's uh, it'd be nice to yeah to keep track of not only how many jobs are running but which which quadrants are still running could definitely be uh helpful in in having more control over this first issue here. Um, another issue that comes up with field by field feature generation is that if the field I found, um, has more than about 10 million light curves, then you'll probably need more than the one soft uh, service unit of memory to, uh, to successfully run without an out of memory error. So at this point, there should only be a few more, like a couple dozen more fields that are going to run into this issue. Cause I, I think we disproportionately have done like more of the galactic plane fields so far. So that's, that's nice that this will be a, you know, most of the fields will not have this issue, but some will. The um, the access allocation that we requested for this accounts for this and mentions this. But um, basically, if you find that the fields have more than 10 million light curves, then you'll need to scale up the memory that you request in the slurm.sub submission, uh, sorry, the slurm.sub job file um, by the number of light curves divided by 10 million. So, you know, 20 million means twice as much memory um, and, uh, and and so forth. You will also concurrently want to decrease the number of uh, max instances in the Slurm submission uh, script because you'll start to run into a maximum memory per user issue where um, you've just doubled the amount of GPU memory per instance, so um, you'll much quicker, much more quickly run into that that limit. And and yeah, I found that like for example, if I'm running a 20 million uh, light curve field. Uh, bring up the memory from 91 um, gigs up to uh, up to 182, and then cut the max instances down to 10 from 20, and that um, that all ran, albeit longer. You know, it takes it takes longer both because it's very populated quadrants and fewer parallel instances, but it does run uh, without error. So the only thing worse than having it run uh, longer is having it run long and then failing because it's out of memory three quarters of the way through. So um, this is another issue I found, and and that's that's my workaround for it. Then there's, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, Kowalski query limitations. So basically, even though you might have more cores to work with, for example, if you scale up your memory and, and reduce your max instances, um, you will still want to limit the number of total cores uh, that are querying Kowalski in parallel. I found that maybe a couple hundred in a row are, are in parallel, like literally like no more than 200 is okay. And, and there is a bit of staggering in the job submission code so that um, it's not necessarily hitting it with all these queries right at once. You know, it'll wait a little while to queer, uh, to um, queue each job and then uh, run the queries. So, um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. It's uh, every now and then you'll see uh, in the Slurm log, some connection error related to a Kowalski query. And you just want to avoid those as much as possible because it will, you know, it'll, it'll basically, uh, that'll mean What's that? Be yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So, yes, exactly. Is All right. Just, like, awesome. Is that a sleep that scales with the number of cores? Um, yeah. I... Right now, it just waits a minute before submitting another job. Yeah. Here's what it does. Yeah. I, I haven't run into issues with it so far. Just like kind of the default settings are in there are seem to be pretty robust. Yeah, this generally isn't an issue, but early on it was. So you also like just have to vary by like five seconds in either direction to make sure they are all like syncing up. Yeah, I, there hasn't been any issues so far. So okay. 
yeah, the minute might be a bit generous, but uh, yeah, just um, seems to be working so far. But uh, yeah, so going down the list here, uh, I mentioned this before, but I feel like it's best when you're like initializing scope with that scope initialize command to um, that's where the code or that's where, you know, like your scope directory is going to be. I just suggest like everything in the HPC files directory can and probably ought to go directly into that scope directory that's initialized. Um, and if you put it, if you put it all there, then, uh, then that's, that's the place for those to be. And it's just easier there. The config does support if your code lives one place and you want to save things elsewhere, it does support that, but mm -hmm. it's a little more complicated, uh, a few more things to fill in. And, uh, yeah, if, like for example, on the clusters, if you're, if you're installing on, um, the, if you just install scope into the like projects storage rather than like your home or scratch, then um, that's probably for the better anyway. And, and it'll mean that everything can live in the same place. So uh, that's just another thing I'll mention. And uh, oh yeah. So then, so for light curve by light curve feature generation, I found that the batches, it's best to limit the batches of, uh, of light curves to less than a hundred thousand per, uh, per feature generation instance. And um and yeah, there's more than that, and just break it up into as many files as you need. Um, and I do run double memory on these. So I run 182 gigs of memory instead of 91 on these jobs. But um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, the limit that after, after which then it starts to, um, even if you're not out of memory, you kind of run out of time. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of best practice there. And there's a guide that lists these issues as well that you can check out, uh, again, in the scope documentation. Other questions on this? All right. Well, thank you all for sticking with me. So uh, we're on to inference now. So this is very analogous again. Uh, you're starting to hopefully see a bit of a pattern here in the scripts and the structure. Um, again, in the HPC files examples, you can see the uh, DNN inference and XGB inference directories for example scripts here. They're structured very similarly, similarly with a logs and a slurm directory. And uh, you'll also want to see these uh, inference scripts called get all preds DNN DR16 and get all preds XGB DR16. These are scripts that are referenced by the Slurm scripts that you run to uh, to run inference. And so you can use what's already generated uh, in the example files. You can also just create these with create inference script. Um, although you need to have the trained models on location there for them to uh, reference. And then, like I said, the Slurm scripts reference these uh, these inference scripts. I'll just show one real quick. Um, oops, I keep going to Safari. Let's go to Google. Okay, and go back here to get all preds DNN DR16, for example. So it's it's uh, it's not the prettiest script. It's uh, it's really just one line here with uh, it calls scopes run inference code, and then it provides a bunch of paths to the different models um, that uh, where they're saved. Uh, so by default, that's in um, either models DNN or models XGB is the name of the directory it's looking for. And then if you want to use the latest up-to-date trained models, you want to use either trained DNN models or trained XGB models. These are downloadable from the uh, Zenodo um, in compressed format here. So you just pop these into directories called models DNN and models XGB, and you're, you should be good to go once you decompress them. And uh, and then it just provides all of these, all the different binary classifiers that you're training um, then it provides the uh, classification abbreviation associated with each one, so model class names. Um, so here's some familiar different kinds of uh, classifiers that we train. Um, there's a wild card for what field you're running on, and then there's just a few other flags here. Um, and basically, then the Slurm scripts will, will repeatedly uh, run these for different uh, field numbers that they pass in. So uh, that's how that works. And uh, um, yeah, so you want to have these scripts when you're running inference. Same uh, the same models you mean uh yes we, yeah we're not uh no right yeah no retraining the the last retraining happens uh with the referee report we included the Gaia parallax error as a feature um but that was the uh the only change I see ashish has a question or comment yes yeah, so I had a question for this the inference is specifically on field-wide feature sets or can it also be done on smaller sets? Uh, it can also be done on smaller sets. So um, that's not something I've generally spent as much time developing because, you know, generally like with the with the smaller sets, that's been for um, like the period finding, but there is code in scope 
uh, that kind of runs you through the whole um, the whole process from uh, feature generations inference um, for any list of uh, either RAs and Zx or ZTF like curve IDs that you want. Um, yeah, so right. it's, so if you have a random ZTF ID, there would be a way to generate features and run inference on that. That's correct. And right now, yeah, right now that runs on. Sorry, I keep doing that. Uh, I uh, that runs on. Uh, definitely CPU like like locally. So the script is going to be called. Uh, let's see, it's going to be. I think it's in. I think it's in tools, and let's just see if I can find it real quick. Yeah. So there are a few um, example files here of like if you give it either RAs and DEX uh, in a CSV format like this, or uh, ZTF like curve IDs like uh, like in that format. Then the script is going to be um, run scope local dot py, and uh, yeah. So then, yeah, there is some documentation on this as well. But yeah, this is the uh, the place you go for kind of the the one stop shop feature generation and inference, but definitely on a smaller scale. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Sure. Okay. And and again, there's a yeah. Check out the guide for for running inference on the docs as well. Uh, one of the things about the inference, uh, there's two separate fields in the configuration file for the fields to include. There's fields to include for feature generation and a section for fields to include for inference. So you need to have, you need to have the fields in both of those. But the exclude list is universal. Yes, that's you correct. Make sure they're in both places. Yeah, it could be a bit tricky there, but yes, that's a good thing to point out. Thank you. Okay. So Brian, if I may, one more question. Yeah. So clearly, what would happen here is that um, the inference tool will depend on the model that we have, which depends on the set of features that we have. So there has to be some kind of a version related to that. In the future, if we decide to add one more feature, so adding code about the feature, putting the feature name somewhere, developing a new model which includes that feature and being able to run inference on that feature. So how many places would one need to do the changes? And is that something that's documented and people can do easy future versioning with those? Yeah, that's a good question. So it, it, it uh, I, I'm not sure how specifically documented that is, um, but I'll, well, I'll certainly start by, uh, by mentioning it here on the, on the call and, uh, and and maybe I can add a little more documentation to to make that clearer. But basically, uh, it's it's going to be in the config file. Uh, so uh, let's go to config.defaults.yaml. And basically, as we scroll down in this very long config file, eventually we'll get down to the list of features. Um, okay. So yeah, it's in the section called features. And uh, basically, we have the uh, the familiar phenomenological features, and we have a list of ontological features, which uh, which kind of repeats these phenomenological features and includes other ones as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you were to add a feature, then you'd want to add the uh, um, add the name here as well as information about first of all whether to include it or not. Because you know some things we we have available but don't actually want to classify on them. Uh, the data type and uh, whether it's what I call a periodic feature or not. Um, most of these are not, but then uh, the Fourier. Uh, the Fourier features are so basically anything that uses the period uh, is uh, in uh, the generation of those features is going to be what's called a periodic uh, feature, and it's just it's just there because these will then take a, a subscript associated with the period finding algorithm that are uh, was used to generate them, um, and so yeah, you'd want to add uh, features to this list here or or ontological or both depending on you know um, whether you wanted it to be you know included in all classifiers or a subset of them. And um, yeah, off the top of my head, I think that's the main place you'd want to add any uh, information. And then um, as long as include is set to true, then the code should look for uh, um, the code should look for that additional feature. And uh, and yeah, I think I think then you'd have issues as soon as you make that change, then any old model that you're like loading in for, uh, say, inference you know, it'll 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 raise an error because uh, there's a feature that's that it wants the code wants to include that is not there. You know, in the trained model. But if you're training new models, then yeah, this is the spot that you would uh, be adding a feature to. Right. So I guess one piece of useful documentation could be 
which are the pieces that need to be touched in such a situation. And then if a version number can be maintained that mirrors each other for all those components, that will be useful. Yeah, I agree. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do about that documentation and uh, just make it a little clearer um, how to how to make that addition. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions from anyone about inference? All right. If not, then we're uh, we're moving along. So a uh, a break from the code here to talk about Zenodo data releases. So uh, the link here to what it'll resolve to whatever the most recent Zenodo release is this uh, this link here. We've already taken a look at the uh, uh, Zenodo uh, data here, and so this is uh, this is what it looks like. We've got basically the abstract from our paper, and uh, we've got these release notes that we now have for two different versions because we. Uh, we, we made more significant changes from uh, 0.0.1 to 0.0.2, and then uh, just added some fields for uh, 0.0.3. So uh, this is a good spot to continue updating for uh, for informational release notes. And uh, then we have actually the files that are included. And um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the fundamentals here. So if you're making a new release, then uh, basically you need to be in the uh, this uh, community we have called the ZTF Source Classification Project. Right now there are three of us. Um, who are either owners or curators, and anyone who's a curator or like higher privileges can uh, make a new version here uh, in green. You can edit, and edit only is for the metadata. So if you made a you know typo in the release notes or something, you can fix that, or even the abstract. But if you're adding anything different to the files here or removing, then it's got to be a new version. And so, uh, um, yep. And then if I click on it, then it'll just bring up like the uh, the draft uh, for the new version where you can import any files that you want to keep from the previous version and, uh, or you can upload uh, new ones. And then basically just want to make sure that you uh, give some kind of a date. I usually just give the year and the month, but it could be something more specific if you'd like. Um, you'll want to update the abstract, especially here for the number of light curves classified and the number of ZTF fields that have been completed, as well as the release notes down here. And then when you're done, before you publish, I won't click it now because I, I had some issues clicking this too early, but like uh, it's, yeah, you can click get a DOI now and uh, it'll give you your DOI for that specific release. And then that's probably the last thing I do before then publishing after I preview it, of course, because once you, uh, once you publish the files, then that, that version um, you can't really, you can't modify the files in that version. So, um, but I'll discard this one because we're not making any updates now, but that's the basics for the Zenodo uh, releases. Yeah, I know we've uh, yeah we've got some uh, got some traffic here. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a um, good question. I think I've downloaded it three or four times. <laughs> I don't know how it's is it counting every maybe they're downloading. Yeah, I I, I know what. Uh, interesting. Well, yeah. Maybe maybe they count every time you download one of the files here as you know a download or I don't know. Well, yeah, no, we, we saw it like should be yeah. all versions. Is is the training set in the GitHub repository or does that need to be downloaded? Actually, it, it isn't. I just right. It's yeah, I just plugged in. It's not there. Yeah, it's not there just because you know it is half a gigabyte. Uh, you could make the case for it being there, but even if you're running inference, you you still need it. Is... Right, you're scaling uh, yeah. scaling features based on the uh, the training features. Yeah. You need to get the uh, the trained models as well as the training set need to be in the right places to run inference. Yeah. Can't get away all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So I, I think I mentioned most of this, just that, yeah, right now we're doing this compressed CSV files all into one directory, but uh, that'll probably change going forward. But uh, I do recommend keeping CSV files as opposed to, you know, the Parquet files are tempting to include, but I think it's just, you know, it's human readable. It's a little more, you know, a little easier for a larger group to work with uh, with CSV files. So it's worth the extra storage space. And right now, Zenodo is giving us 100 gigabytes and we're using in our current release roughly 15, less than 15 so at some point, maybe it'll come time to request a little more, but uh, this compression of multiple field files into a, um, 
one file should help us avoid the hundred file like maximum uh, limit. So, uh, no, this is free. All all this is free so far. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, also just yeah, make sure you're updating the fields.json file that will be included when you run the the last step of uh, of the inference process, which is the combined Preds script. Um, and make sure you use semantic versioning here. So right now we're on v o point. 0.3, and you'll just want to keep you know using that structure going forward. There's also a guide on the scope docs about this process that you can check out. Okay, then uh, another release for the code this time um, is the uh, PyPI releases. So there's a link to the uh, uh, the PyPI repository, and uh, this allows you to pip install scope ML. Uh, we have a GitHub Actions workflow that automatically runs when you whenever you release uh, on a new tag, um, it will do this automatically. So let's go over to GitHub and uh, go to um, scope ML and then uh, releases here. And uh, so basically, if we want to draft a new release, we just we click draft a new release, we choose a tag. And so here's where you'll type in your uh, semantic versioning and you know create this on publish. Uh, we can generate release notes um, automatically. And uh, we can also check, I'd recommend checking this box here. It'll make a discussion in the announcements page to uh, talk about the release if anyone wants. And then you just publish release, but uh, you don't want to click this, even if you're ready to release before you've bumped two other parts of the code to a new version. So you'll want to first go to uh, pyproject.toml and just make sure that here where it's version 0.9.4 that you bump it to your new version. Otherwise, this will it'll uh, PyPI will complain that there's already a version that has that version. So it's, it's just an easy thing. I, I've already forgotten it multiple times and had to withhold or withdraw a release from GitHub and then, you know, change that. There's also one more spot in the scope directory in init.py uh, where the version is specified. So just make sure that gets uh, bumped as well. And then you should be good to go. So uh, just a good checklist every time you release. Can be added to the workflow? They probably could be. Um, I, I imagine there might be a way to do that. There's a buffer package that does some of this, or you can take me think about it. But yeah, honestly, it's a very minor. I've also had issues making that work automatically and so on. So this feels easy for it. Mm -hmm. We have the same workflow set up around the morning. Yeah, and MMA has bump, bumper, is bumper compatible as well. But again, it. It doesn't it's, work. I, I've, I've screwed this, I screwed this up. You know? Oh, no, no. We don't. I don't have a. I don't even have a GitHub action with this. So we should adapt. Yeah, we should learn from this. How, how much effort did, did it take to set up the workflow? Uh, it really wasn't too bad. Um, I was able to find it just somewhere on GitHub. And then, uh, um, yeah, I don't think I really needed to modify it too much. Um, this is it. It's pretty short. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah. I guess we have to do a little bit more about with the Python version and stuff. It's in better way to uh, yeah. particular. I should note actually, yeah, this uh yeah, these these tokens, uh this is my PyPI token right now. And I mean I I I don't mind it being there, but just you know, uh okay. yeah, keep in mind. Yeah. Actually, the same with the Kowalski tokens that are also secrets on this uh, repository. Oh, we should, so, yeah, because yeah, I don't know if they'll delete my, you know, we don't use all these tokens, but we definitely use uh, Gloria, Kowalski, Melman. Um, and I think we use the instant, instance tokens now. I think, yeah, these are older. They, they might be the same, but I might have renamed them. Um, and then PyPI token um, is my, my PyPI token. So um, I don't think we use this one anymore. Or if we do... It's not even mine. So, you know, three years ago. So, uh, and the dummy token is, yeah, that could probably be deleted, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Other questions on uh, PyPI? For okay. version updates, like with, like how substantial of an update constitutes a, uh, you know, a third point versus the second point mm. versus the first point. Yeah. In yeah. Um, well, I've really just basically been operating under the the assumption that we're going to be at 0 0.9 point something until, I don't know, we all review it and feel like, you know, this code is ready for 1.0. Uh, and 
Um, we know what we know. Kind of, there, there's a guide, there's like guides to semantic versioning about what should be considered a minor versus a major versus like a, a, a real big change. And I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head where one ends and the next begins, but. Um, when you guys put all, all the fields up on Zenodo, then you can do your one. Or one or one. <laughs> I think for MMAR, they philosophy was like, if it will break someone's workflow, it's that's a second. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Or if there's like a major new feature, but usually if it breaks someone's workflow, it's a, a point something. It yeah, it changes it to like, yeah. And then just anything where it's like, we've accumulated enough changes, it's point, point. So we should work for support of the Exactly. 0.9.5 hundred is right. Well, that's what I'm talking about. 2.0 and all the same. All right, so there's there's one more scope workflow that I want to discuss, and that's the GCN cron job, as I call it. And so the goal here is to run scope uh, feature generation and, and inference on a small set of sources that are basically, they're variables that ZTF has observed very near, as in less than 0.5 arc seconds distance from transient candidates associated with GCN events. <laughs> Many apologies, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's uh, this, it just, it's not classified. So just, it's important to say it's not classifying the transients themselves. That's more the realm of, of BTS and other uh, efforts on that front. Um, but it is classifying any variable sources that are nearby. So I feel like, especially this often ends up being like maybe in, you know, the host galaxies and AGN. So it'll be labeled at least as variable, if not AGN or, you know, something like that. Or maybe there's a, maybe there's a flaring star right nearby. So you know, all just useful things to know. Um, and so the workflow generally is um, uh, the workflow, which all runs locally, except for the feature generation, which gets, gets pushed to expanse, is to query Fritz for GCN notices. And then uh, it'll query the candidates for each uh, event. It'll then, with those candidates, identify any ZTF light curves that are near those transients, um, which will be for you know different variable uh, sources. Then it'll um, take that file, send it up to expanse, generate the features, um, it actually runs so lightweight that I run it on the GPU debug uh, partition because it's a lot shorter wait time um, to queue and it, we, we don't need more resources than that. So that's nice. Um, and then we take those features back. We run inference locally, classify the light curves. We then consolidate the, prediction, the predictions, um, which may be for a bunch of different light curves for one uh, source, basically so that we get one set of classifications per source. So we both flatten it across light curves, and we also flatten it between DNN and XGBoost, the two machine learning algorithms that we run. Um, by default, I think we just take the mean, um, and then that probability for each classifier is the, uh, for each classification is the uh, is associated with that source. And then we post anything that's higher than uh, 0.7 probability to uh, onto Fritz, along with the, uh, uh, the associated light curve plots that we're actually uh, working with. And so what this looks like on Fritz is uh, here's uh, here's one of our uh, one of our events here, and we have the uh, the localization, and I've queried some sources that are uh, you know uh, within that localization, and uh, and then I'm taking a look at the source list here, and uh, you'll see that as you're scrolling through, you'll see this uh, kind of blue classification. In this case, it's it's prefaced by an ML for uh, being a machine learning classification rather than a human classification, and uh, and it's in this one saying non-variable. And so if I, uh, if I take a look at that source, then uh, actually this is not the right, uh, that's not the right one. I mean, that, that one's useful, interesting too, but um, basically then you click in and, uh, and we've got our, our classification here. It's a probability of uh, about 0.76. And uh, so in addition to the classification that was posted, you'll also see the, uh, uh, both the face folded and the, uh, just the time series uh, light curve. Um, so, and posted as comments. Those are the figures that were. Yes, that's right. Um, maybe it actually is interesting to look at this one as well, because here it was manually classified as an AGN, but uh, we also did pick it up as variable. Um, and just what that looks like in the time series, it's something like this. So, um, yeah. Is there any value to like automating this more? 
Um, well, so the, the script that runs is pretty automatic. So it's designed to run every few hours and just, uh, yeah. So this is, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, right. Oh yeah. Locally, but not manually. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. This is what I'm running on the SPA. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I uh, was there. Another question. Usually when I think locally it's flat. Yeah. You know, it's codes. This is literally a macro. Yeah. Your cluster account or something. So. Yeah, except instead of the cluster, the only part that uses the cluster is the GPU part. And then otherwise we just, you know, it's just literally a cron job on my Mac. Yeah. Oh, it is on the Mac. Yeah, it's been running on on here. Uh yeah. And you and you set it up just on the CSE cluster. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that can just go on its own and I don't have to worry about it eating up uh, my personal resources. 1% of your battery. <laughs> so, yeah, that's um, it's really about about all I wanted to say with this. I think, um, you know, there's, there's some good documentation available, uh, these three different links for, first of all, what this, what this workflow actually does and what the goal is scientifically. And then some details about getting the cron job set up and um, um, yeah, and just and, and running automated analyses in general. So uh, yeah, I think this is pretty well documented and uh, something that I think will be nice to nice to continue going forward. And I say at this point, Daniel really has it like he, it's, it's running uh, all this the 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 field by field feature generation and the uh, the cron job. They're they're, they're running and uh, running as we expect. So yeah, yeah, I've gone through getting all this to work before so I would probably be helping other people set it up if they they need to. All right. No, we're getting there. Just a uh this is a slide to uh just summarize this, the current status of these workflows. Uh so uh we've got 77 fields done with uh a little over 200 million likers classified with these two uh machine learning algorithms. And uh so this catalog will continue to grow. So Daniel's been uh working on this and I estimate very, very rough estimate. It could take about a year to finish the primary field feature generation and inference. Um, that's, you know, it, it might take a little longer than that. It really depends on uh, how manual versus automated the whole process is, but that's the rough estimate. Um, and I think the access GPU resources that we've recently gotten should be enough to finish um, this process, but uh, you could always, we could always, you know, submit a supplement going forward that, you know, they, they are definitely receptive to that. If we've shown that we're most of the way there and we need a little more, that's not a problem. Um, we are going to want to um, also get this running on Delta, the Delta resource. Uh, there's, a, I put together an example directory with some Slurp scripts specifically for Delta, like I said. So check those out. Um, although again, it's still running more slowly on Delta than it should be compared to Expanse. So um, something we'll have, you know, have to figure out, but uh, uh, yes, yeah, Ashish. So typically when you run things, why does it not just continue running? What are the reasons where it fails and you need to babysit and do something? Yeah, so first is the uh, the job timeout. So the submission script that we run will only go for 48 hours before stopping um, just because of the cluster limitations. So then then that has to be run again. Uh, and uh, I guess then combining that with just the potential for Again, either like a cluster glitch or a Kowalski glitch or something to um, prevent a field from um, having all the quadrants run as we expect them to. Um, then that has to be that that submission job has to be like queued again, um, and you know some manual checking at least for now going on. So these things could be automated more in the future, so that we could get it to the point you're just you know when one 48 hour submission job runs and the next 48 hour one starts, you know. And so um, that could definitely be implemented going forward, but for now there's a bit just enough manual input required to, uh, um, you know, slow it down a bit. Would it be viable to split the field job up into quadrants? Um, so that is, that is how it's, uh, doing it right now. So yeah. Um, yeah, basically every field will queue 64 jobs, uh, -huh. uh 20 at a time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And those two things, two, three things that you mentioned, are those also documented if we want to see how those could be automated further? Uh, yes. So I think, yeah, these are uh, basically the, the pitfalls slide that I mentioned, where as I mentioned, uh, that's like, uh, that corresponds right. to some documentation in the scope um, uh, docs. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not too fast. Oh, okay. You just, yeah, you just 
click the button once every two days. What if you put two days of effort into making it so you didn't have to click the button? Well, the time it takes to submit the script is a couple of seconds. So it's, pro it's probably not worth spending two days to automate all of that. <laughs> and sometimes it just breaks. Like I ran into an error. I don't even know what it was. And it just, the submission job just killed itself. Yeah. So I think, I mean, if I'm the one, like I'm okay running all of them like every two days. So like, I'm willing to do that, so I don't feel like it's not worth automating. I'm willing to just do it. Well, you press the button. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Um, yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
most recently, like added some benchmark plots to that repository, um, as well as retraining everything um, just to get it all up to date. But uh, yeah, so that's something that maybe is, uh, that'll be an important kind of regular thing going on as we add more grids, add more uh, training techniques and, you know, and, and some files associated with that. We should also update our reference feed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. A really important PR. <laughs> Yeah, so um, let's see. And those GitLab, since you and Theo, who owns them currently, so Theo yeah. at least can, okay. That's right. Transfer. Yes. Right, so we'll need to expand that list. But yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So associated with NMMA is the API service that basically allows us to use SkyPortal and Fritz to initiate NMMA analyses. And uh, so I'll just, I'll show that real quick. So if you go to any of these transients on uh, on Fritz, then down here in the uh, external analysis section, you can start a new analysis and there's NMMA. Um, you can choose the model that you want to uh, to use for, uh, for the fitting and then the time range. Optionally, you can uh, specify the filters to include uh, and instruments to include, and then you can uh, then you submit it. And basically when you submit, it'll format the, phot the photometric data, it'll send it up to Expanse um, where it will run the, uh, the NMA analysis, and then send back the results and uh, and present them in a in a nice way here that uh, that Fritz will show. And so, um, does the NMA API have its own account on Expanse, or is it through yours? It is. That's yeah. I was going to get to that. It's through mine right now. So okay. yeah. So yes, with this yeah, with this in mind, yeah, it's important because uh, yeah, I, again, I you know who knows. I don't know how long that account will last. Uh, so I don't think Mike is chomping at the bit to get it deleted. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah. And so I think, yeah, basically, yeah, right now, basically somewhere in this NMA API config, um, my Expanse token is, or, you know, my Expanse information is specified. And uh, so that could be updated, you know. Basically, the only uh, the only constraint here is that um, you, you do need to then install NMA on whatever account will be, you know, connected with this API code. Um, which is pretty straightforward, uh, at least on Expanse, I found. Uh, it does require, at least by default, that in addition to all the directories that come with NMA, that you have this, like, uh, at least by default, this is called slurm logs, um, so that it has somewhere to put the uh, the log files. And the the example slurm script that I recently added to NMA is going to look for that um, directory. So it's in slurm.sub here on the NMA repository. And you see here, it's you know it's going to look for slurm logs in the main NMA directory. But um, other than that, I think this um, I think this slurm script basically, if you pop this into you know your installation of NMA on the cluster, then um, and and give it the right credentials, then the API should continue to work. Um, yeah, nothing nothing else about this is customized for my um, my account. So uh, no, definitely not. No, whatever's sure. yeah, whatever's easiest. Yeah, I don't mind, but just want to you know, I don't want there to be a a surprise one day or you know, Everything's yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do so. we have anything in first to handle if it, if it doesn't? No. Okay. Now we should have you set up. Sorry, my guess. Should be a good thing to do. Yeah. I'll set up a Kaviva account. Yeah. So yeah, just a few links here for the API repo and the and the Slurm script I just uh, shared. How um how dependent is that on the expanse? Like how plug and play do you reckon it will be with another cluster? It pretty plug and play, but not entirely. So um, actually, this one we don't really load any Slurm uh, expanse specific modules for this one, so it's probably pretty uh, unless you need to load those modules for another cluster. But um, yeah, this one's actually even more. Um, Maybe more plug and play than the scope ones are, because the scope ones require a few, just a few modules to be loaded that, of course, have a different name or you know way of loading them in another another cluster. So this one's, uh, yeah, definitely more flexible. Let's not Zenosai. Good to know for the future in case we need to move it to something else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions on NMA? All right. We're just about there. I just want to mention, you know, I said that one slide with just a few potential future directions that you know, I kind of crossed my mind on the more scientific side of things. So um, I think first and foremost, you know, we have this 200 million uh, light curve classification catalog that uh, 
uh, really, I think could be very interesting and informative for for studies of variable uh, objects and uh, and even potentially, you know, uh, supplementing maybe target lists for future surveys and things like that. So, um, yeah, I would definitely be interested in uh, you know encouraging um, the you know the use of the catalog itself. You know, we put all this uh, all the effort into uh, you know getting these workflows running and uh, and generating all these uh, classifications. But yeah, I think and this is being done with like the experiments, the ZTF experiments and things like that. But uh, yeah, I think continuing to, uh, yeah, take advantage of just the the large scale of, uh, of variable classifications here would be uh, of, of great scientific interest. Um, on the uh, computational side of, and machine learning side of things, I think, first of all, like finding a way, whether it's through a link collaboration or, um, or, or otherwise, like finding a way to further accelerate the period finding al algorithms that we're uh, using um, could just make the most of the resources we have and be... Uh, uh, be of interest both to ZTF and, and in the future. Um, I think first and foremost, that might, you know, I'm not, you know, sure, maybe, maybe there's a way we could maximize the use of our current, uh, of our, of the GPUs we have right now occurring using our current algorithms. So, um, you know, maybe we're not utilizing those, uh, to their full, um, availability. And maybe that's part of the reason, uh, on Delta that it's running a little slower, but definitely something of interest, um, I think there's also some interesting period finding approaches that are being discussed in the uh, the ZVAR working group. So continuing to follow along with those and uh, uh, potentially implementing some, but yeah, just definitely keeping uh, informed on that will be good. Um, in in talking to um, actually someone here at the U, I got these interesting machine learning suggestions to one uh, try training a normalizing flow to estimate the periods rather than, you know, the low scar goal and other uh, traditional approaches that we have. Uh, not sure how feasible that is, but, you know, it could very much, uh, if it performs well, it would drastically speed up the period finding, but there's, there's the rub, you know, if it performs well. Um, and then it, it, this, this person also recommended that I, or suggested like I try a, uh, using like a transformer, uh, model to like, just generate a whole set of new features, um, uh, automatically, uh, you know, rather than using the features or maybe in combination with the features, at least some of them that we use right now and that are important for classification. So again, not sure how feasible that is, but just thought I'd, uh, you know, mention it as a uh, kind of interesting, you know, getting down in the machine learning weeds a little more, but potentially with uh, with a lot of reward there. Um, I think also kind of taking steps towards unifying the ways that we classify transients and variables amid our collaborations could be just a useful uh, uh, a useful way to uh, to take things that are right now somewhat separate and you know make them a little more uh, kind of uh, working jointly with each other. And uh, on the NMA side of things, I think the uh, yeah the normalizing flow code that um, is being used to speed up inference there is really interesting. So the name of the game is, I feel like is speed with all this. I think there's some really interesting um, ways that that's being done now, both with that, with that code and then the uh, the NMA JAX efforts that are uh, that are ongoing. So, um, I yeah, I just uh, definitely am a uh, cheerleader on those kind of things. It's uh, it'll be uh, of of good scientific value for um, uh, for that uh, collaboration going forward. Um, yes, scope five. with some say, obviously significant improvement to the way that things are done if you're looking mm. at new stuff. Yeah, it's a good question. Um I think can you repeat the question please? Yeah, so yeah, the question uh, was basically, you know, sc the scope, you know, the scope four paper will be reporting the full set of classifications, you know, with our current um our current approach. But then, you know, what about scope five, the paper after that, you know, what um what ought to be done either machine learning wise or otherwise, you know, to, uh, to build on these, uh, on this work, uh, going forward. So Ashish, feel free if, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you'll have some uh, thoughts on this as well. Um, you know, um, it, I mean, it doesn't, it's not quite scope at that point, but, you know, I suspect that using Dax force, but sort of force photometry. So, right. So one, one shortcoming I'll say of scope as a, concept is we only go down to sort of five sigma for our light groups. 
Zach and the rest of the Caltech folks have really focused on running what we call force photometry, but basically you know the locations of all of kind of the stars to a reasonable depth from chromatic pan stars, running the light curves, you know, at all of these points. And so you can go down to even one sigma, two sigma type stuff. And so they can go half a magnitude deeper sort of using that trick. And so, again, I'm, I'm not sure if you call it, you know, scope five at that point, but you know, the, the same concept, but on force photometry, I think is a, is a clear, going to be a clear winner here. Um, and it's already, I mean, you're, you guys are already working towards it with the, some of this experiment stuff, but yeah, I think that's one, one use. Yeah, and in addition to that, I'd be very interested in disambiguating the sources that currently multiple of our classifiers claim to be of their type. We have lots of those. So we have these secure classifications and the non-variables, and in between there are lots of objects. And the problem there, of course, is our sparse uh, light curves combined with the somewhat biased features that we have. So the other approach that you mentioned about generating automated features, that would in fact be a very good thing provided we can. So the good training sets that we have been generating through the current scope, combining that with such methods would be an obvious next step in terms of machine learning, being able to go down to, and including force photometry and going down to fainter levels would be uh, combining those different approaches. And I think that would be a great thing. I think this is probably scope six, but I personally really, I really think the transient slash variable combo stuff. I mean, right now the algorithms are pretty separate, but it doesn't have to be that way. Well, you can add another nice scope. Well, yeah, and any and, and, and scope type thing. You know. So we gotta come up with a better action. Yeah. Don't play with animals. We could add a rate to acronym. Where each letter of the acronym is itself another acronym. So I haven't found one that exists yet. And S. So are there yeah are there yeah are there any other questions um I, thanks for sticking with me for almost two hours here I thanks for yeah. getting another uh, thesis presentation <laughs> yeah so yeah so with that I yeah I just want to end conclude with a big thank you um to a lot of people and and, and organizations and just a few of them you know especially to Michael for giving this opportunity for being a great advisor and uh um, and I mean, there are too many people to name, but, uh, Ashish as well, and Matthew and, uh, vibrations. So, you know, you know being part of ZTF and, uh, NMA and, uh, the A3D3 Institute. And, uh, um, so yeah, I just want to big thank you to all of them and, and to all the people who have had the pleasure of working with in this room on zoom and, and beyond. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure and, uh, thank you very much. These people here should eat more cake. Yes. More cake. Yeah, I'm going to ruin my supper. Yeah, that is. Yeah, exactly. I've got a Trader Joe's souvenir. <laughs>